not proud of this school at all. Um, <laughs> what I want to do is first thank Principal Schaefer, Catherine Heath, and Jamie Emery for making this happen. Um, they are in integral to what happens in this school with the arts department, with um, education, with everything that makes this place special and what it is. I want to turn the mic over for just a minute to um, Catherine so that she can give a shameless plug for an upcoming event. <coughs> As many of you know, working in school, we wear many hats, so our building wearing many hats is appropriate. We are happy to have you guys here. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, our theater director, Jamie Emery, on purpose left the curtains open as her <coughs> students have been working tires, tire, tirelessly uh, on their set and getting ready for our play, Chicago, next week. Um, she would love for the community to come out Thursday, uh, <coughs> Thursday and Friday, 7 p.m. shows, and then two shows on Saturday at 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. So next week, if you guys feel like coming to Lawson to see a great performance, our students uh, won awards in the fall for their play. We're super excited to put on Chicago next week. So come on. <coughs> everybody that you're looking at and we'll go from my right to the left and first we have Todd I am afraid I'm gonna butcher it but Todd Ogle Cheney with see I did it um, with the Metro Planning Department he's our deputy director and next to him we have my friend Commander Lee Kendall from the West Precinct and to his left we have Will Dodd Will Dodd is with Code's department and then we have my friend Matthew Wilkinson from the council office, who is also attached to the planning department. At the table on my right is one of my good friends and executive director of the Belgian Chamber of Commerce, Patty Dewall. To her left, my right, is council member at large, Olivia Hill, who lives in Bellevue, which is great. We're happy to have her here. Behind me, is council member Robin Horton. He is the district 20 council member and he is representing the nation's area as well as the author and sponsor, primary sponsor of several of the zoning bills we'll discuss tonight. And then to his left is my partner in crime who sits to my right in the council office and the council chambers and that is council member Tom Druckel from district 23 and he represents the West Mead area and beyond. And to his left is my Belby partner in crime, one of the three of us, um, Jason Spain. And Jason Spain represents the District 35, which if you think about Belby as a donut, I'm the donut hole and he's a big part of the donut. <laughs> <laughs> so when Dave Rosenberg was in his seat before, I used to tell people I was in the heart of Belby. He said, yeah, I was in the brownies. Um, use that a lot. <laughs> yeah, he does use a lot. Um, and so to his left, and at the end of the row, to my left, is council member Sandy Ewing. And Sandy is in District 34, and she has um, Oak Hill and no, Bellevue, no, Forest Hills. Forest Hills, I'm sorry. Carter Green Hills and I'll let a little slice of Bellevue. Yeah, I'll let you have her But she has a lot of things. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do now is give each one of our city council members an opportunity to address you and um, we're going to time them so that they don't get long in we'll start with sandy thanks first of all i just want okay so District 34, I live in the little slice of Bellevue that's included in District 34, so I live right near Evan Warner Park. Um, and so I, I, much of my heart lies in Bellevue, but I also love all of D34. Um, I wanna just thank all of you for being here. Um, I think, okay, this is gonna be corny, so I'm very sorry, but I'm a corny person. 
The health of our democracy depends on people engaging, and we depend on you engaging with us and telling us how you feel, what you need, what you want. Um, and so thank you. I really, really appreciate you being here. And hopefully you'll walk away having um, satisfied your curiosity on some things, had some questions to answer, or at the very least, gotten to have a say on whatever is on your mind. Thanks. I'm Jason Spain. I'm the district council member for District 35. Um, I, I was born and raised here in Bellevue. Uh, my parents moved here in 1974, I think, and, and what then was District 35 since the last redistricting. Um, my mom actually moved to Cherry's district, which she was none too pleased about, um, but that's not her fault. Um, so one of the things, uh, you know, I spent a good amount of time over the summer going door to door. I probably came to some of your doors. Um, might have thought some of you, some of you might have seen me on the ring camera and, and you know, gone through another part of the house. And I don't blame you for that at all. But if you did come to the door, one of the things that we probably talked about was the importance of preserving the, the, the uh, community that we have and to make sure that development works uh, <coughs> for us and doesn't happen to us. And so that's when we first started talking about these zoning proposals, that was sort of the lens that a lot of us were looking at it through, that we, uh, these are clearly issues that need to be addressed, but we need to be sure that we're addressing them the right way. So thank you all for being here. Um, your feedback will, will help to enable us to do that. And this is obviously going to be a conversation that continues over uh, several months. So we appreciate you being here to, uh, to be here on the front end of it. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Council Lady Wieners. Gave me 30 minutes to give my speech. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> I don't think I, so. I'm sorry. Um, I see my friends from uh, uh, Brookmead Park back there, and uh, uh, my council is District 23. Uh, we get, we meet at Tailgate on, on uh, Wednesdays, just so you know, if you ever right? Um, anyhow, uh, District 23, Bellevue, Westmead, Hillwood, I have a part of uh, Bellevue. That as you come out Harding, um, I had to Old Hickory and back Charlotte. I have a significant part of that area. So you just slice it off. We try to confuse you really well. We change it every 10 years on top of that, right? Uh, but I have that part of value. If you go on, you can always sort of figure out where we're at. Um, I, I got here about 25 years ago. Uh, we moved 15 times around the country. I was in the hotel business. And we fell in love with Westmead. Uh, gave us a little bit of a nature um, and country, and we felt really good about it. And uh, my job is to preserve what we got, right? It's just actually a beautiful place, and, uh, and that's what I'm all about. Great to have you tonight. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Roland Horton. I'm the District 20 Council member. Uh, District 20 is the Nations, uh, Charlotte Park, James Robertson, the western half of White Ridge, and a small part of Hillwood. So I don't, I'm not part of the Greater Bellevue. Uh, so I'm very grateful for y'all and the other council members uh, for having me here today. It's very kind. Uh, as Sherry mentioned, I'm the author of uh, three of the zoning and building code reform items that we're going to be discussing tonight. Uh, so look forward to speaking with you all about them uh, when we get to that part. Thank you. My name is Olivia Hill. I uh, fourth generation actually, and I grew up here in Bellevue. I uh, we lived in West Mead till '78, '79, and we moved to Bellevue. And so I've been here. You know, within about six miles my whole life, except for the 10 years I've been in the Navy. I worked at Vanderbilt University where I used to run a power plant, and then I retired two years ago and ran for office. And so uh, I'm at large, so I'm here. <laughs> and now I'm going to do short people. Um, so what I'd like to do is introduce Commander Reed Kendall from the West Precinct. He's going to <clears throat> give us an update on the crime in the area and what Metro is doing about it. Commander Kendall. Okay, Shelby, over there. All right, my name is Lee Kendall. I've been in law enforcement for about 29 years altogether. Uh, I worked for a state agency prior to the Kentucky State Police, and they do familiar with that agency. 
Um, I have worked for Metro Nashville uh, Police Department now for uh, nearly 23 years. Uh, I've, I've served in on a lot of different positions throughout my career. Uh, I have been on the SWAT team here. Uh, I've been a field training officer back when I was in patrol. I've worked in investigations. I've been a detective. I've been uh, a lieutenant over the domestic violence division. I've been at the training academy and training our troops uh, in law enforcement. Uh, I've worked for uh, Chief Green as the executive officer for the Community Services Bureau. Um, and I've, I've served in some other capacities as well. I won't, I won't go on and on about uh, those things I've done, but really I just wanted to be here today to talk to you and, and answer questions and or cover some of the crime in West Precinct. We've got about 108 square miles. We're very large, one of the largest geographical areas in all of Nashville that we cover. Uh, I've got 81 officers. Uh, of those 81, uh, with the exception of our four uh, four day, 10 hour overlap periods, uh, I run about five to six officers for all that coverage, all that area. Uh, I know, and I know that that sounds like how in the world do you do that? Well, we have good sergeants and good lieutenants that manage uh, those calls for service. Some of the other things that Chief Grace has brought uh, to our police department that have, that have worked out very good uh, is the uh, APR, the All Alternative Police Reporting, which is out at North Precinct. That allows for uh, citizens to be able to call in and file minor reports without having the officer dispatched to their location. Now we still do prints and things like that. So when you go when you go through that service, for instance, I may call and say I need I need a police report filed uh, for my vehicle being broken into, uh, and then that that retired officer we have experience out there. We have retirees that work out there, and uh, there's about 30, 30 some of them that work out there, different shifts, and they will they will say well. We can, we can take the report for you, but we'll send an officer out to you if you'd like to do prints. So that's, that's kind of how the, the alternative police reporting works. We also uh, implemented a new program recently where citizens can go online to file reports, not through the APR system. So other minor reports, you can go online and do that as well. This helps the community because they don't, nobody wants to wait uh, for a service for public service. So that's why Chief Drake and the executive staff have implemented these program, programs and it's been funded uh, obviously through our, our Metro Council and their support. So thank, thank you for doing all that and helping us provide those, those services to our community. Uh, it's working out really well because about 30% of the calls for service that we get are ran through the APR. And when you think about that, that is thousands and thousands of calls that they're not waiting 10, 15 minutes for an officer to drive across 108 square miles to get to them. And that's, that's what our goal is. Chief Drake is very much uh, making that a priority of better response times for all of you. Uh, and if you've ever had to wait, it is very frustrating. And I understand that first and foremost. Uh, I think about how my family would feel. So that's why I'm very passionate about trying to get you service better uh, in West Creek Center. Violent crime. Let's talk a little bit about that. So violent crime, you have had uh, two homicides here today in the West Precinct area. One of those homicides was domestic violence related. Uh, that's where the 71 year old male killed his wife. Uh, and uh, that incident is solved and it was solved very quickly by the cold case uh, division. When we have a missing person, the cold case division works missing persons. That's why homicide didn't investigate that case. The other homicide was involving two uh, very young gentlemen uh, at the Kroger out here at Bellevue. It was a shooting and it involved drugs, drug activity. So it was a robbery that went bad. Uh, so that's your other homicide. The other shooting incident that we had that fortunately did not turn into a homicide but it was very close because it was life threatening to me. Uh, and that was out by the Circle K, if y'all remember. Highway 70 uh, and OHB area. Y'all know where the Circle K is? Two juveniles met up there. And again, another drug related robbery. 
Now, aside from the domestic violence on the side, these people don't live in Bellevue. They come out here. Well, why are they coming out here? I've been asked that question before. Well, because it's a safe community, and they think that they can come out here and do activity that, that won't go notice, or maybe there's not as many police officers out here, or maybe they don't think that uh, they'll get caught. I'm not 100% sure why they, they would come out here to try to do a drug deal in this area, but that's what my suspicions are, and that's, that's, that is what has happened out there with those violent incidents. Um, we are down 2% overall in violent crime in West Precinct. Uh, that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but to me, anytime we can have a decrease from the previous year, that's a win, especially in law enforcement. So I thank those of you all who have called in incidents, who, who help stop things before they happen. If you see something, say something, you call us, uh, we will get there and we respond to calls based off priority. So the more information we get and the more information you give to the dispatcher, the better we are and the, the higher priority that you will get on, on the call for service. What is driving up the crime overall in Devon? So what I'm seeing and what the investigators are seeing and what the officers in, in the field are seeing, Highway 70 South, OHB, uh, we have a lot of apartment complexes uh, in communities. And we are seeing uh, a lot of juvenile crime. We are seeing mostly theft of motor vehicles, auto thefts, and shoplifting. Those are all property crimes, but the auto thefts and the theft of motor vehicles are related to violent crimes because they are stealing cars to go out and commit violent crimes in other areas, not just in West, but in other areas in Nashville. This is a nationwide problem. Uh, most of you have seen the studies and, you, and, you, and you, you know what's going on across the nation. The Kia, the Hyundai, they use the software method where they use the USB port and they break into the vehicle and then they use that, it starts the vehicle and then they steal it. And then they go and steal another one, and they commit another crime. The theft motor vehicles, what, what, what our suspects are looking for, and they'll go into a community, and they'll stop the car, and four will get out, and they'll walk through that community, and they'll just start checking doors. You've seen it on ring cameras. You've seen it on apartment complex videos. You've seen it through the media, through Don Aaron's office. When we get video, we share it with everybody. And that's what, and that's what they're doing, and then they're targeting these communities to break into uh, cars. And what they're looking for is guns. So on that topic, uh, stolen guns from vehicles, I've had 22 year to date in West. Recovered firearms, we've recovered 28 stolen firearms in West. So we've actually recovered more than we had stolen. We're down four uh, last year on the recovery. Uh, but it's still a win because if you're recovering more weapons than you had stolen, that's pretty good. Um, we've had 48 recovered vehicles in West alone. All, not all the vehicles that they're stealing in West uh, are we recovering here. They're, they're taking out to other locations. Some, some of them are going outside the county. Uh, and most of the suspects, again, that are stealing the cars here, they don't live here. They, may, they, live, they, may, they might live in Antioch. They might live in other parts. They might live out of county. That's what we're seeing a whole lot of. But I can assure you, a lot of them don't live in uh, our community out here. Motor vehicle thefts, year to date, 131. Uh, this time last year, we had 50. We are up that much in uh, motor vehicle thefts. What are we doing about it? Yes, sir. What about cameras though? I'm sorry. So uh, I, I strongly recommend these cameras. Uh, 
because it's it's the best mitigation tool to prevent the thefts in those areas. Um, but, but that location would be a great location uh, specifically to have more cameras put up, especially around the I would say the Initiated Operation 72. Operation 72 is an effort where we took all of the community field intelligence teams, all eight of them, each precinct has a field intelligence team. I gave mine up, all the other precincts gave theirs up, and we began to focus merely on the motor vehicle thefts and the theft of motor vehicles and the recovery of vehicles, and specifically getting those weapons off the street. And that effort has been very, very successful. Um, when they came out to West two weeks ago, eight juveniles arrested, multiple guns recovered, and multiple vehicles. These were from just a few apartment complexes that I won't mention tonight, but I will say that they were along the Highway 70 OHB area. Um, some, of those, some of those complexes are in the HA and or uh, low income uh, housing uh, apartment complexes. So what am I doing about it? Well, I met with, uh, I had apartment managers meeting, some of the council members uh, were able to, to attend it. And uh, we had that just yesterday. And we had a pretty good turnout. We had about 10 different apartment complexes came out and we spoke to them about crime, what they can do, the mitigations that they can have in place, the cameras, having better lighting, which is really important to have better lighting because if you're a criminal, where are you gonna target? Those, those, those places that are not lit up. And these, these crimes are being committed overnight. They're occurring between 20, I was gonna say military time, between 10 p.m. and 06 in the morning. And that's when I'm running my initiatives. That's, that's when I've got, I've got overtime uh, allocated money that I can spend to have the officers when they're off duty to come out and work initiatives in your areas where you're having theft motor vehicles and other crimes. So, if you're having crimes or you know of activities occurring, please email us, contact us, and let us know so we can have those officers to work your areas more. It's, it's, a, it's a multiplier, and, it, and it's one of the only tools I've really got to, you know, move those officers to those areas. Uh, but, as I said, the C-15 has done a fantastic job. They're getting the, the stolen cars and the, and the weapons, and they're doing it safely. More importantly, they are doing it very tactical and safely. They're not doing pursuits. They're using aviation as an asset tool to go out there. They're using tracking tools and things like that on the vehicles. So they don't have to pursue them. They know exactly where they're going because at the same time we've got GPS. We got a lot of technology that we're using uh, to make it safer. Uh, let's see, strategies. Operation 72, I mentioned. The crime reduction initiative where I uh, have the uh, overtime uh, initiative to move the officers to those areas. The overlap I mentioned, which during the four tens, uh, Chief Drake, Chief Green, some of the executive staff, they got to thinking, what can we do to better get the, the most bang for the buck of having officers out on the streets? They changed the shift to four tens, and then you have a longer amount of time when the officers are during that overlap. So three, four hours during the overlap, and my phone's going off, I think. <laughs> my apologies. Um, but the overlap has been very beneficial to us all. Uh, instead of five officers, we have 10 officers during that time. And, it, and it's during those peak hours when the crimes are occurring. X patrols. X patrols is where we intentionally send an officer out to that location, like I mentioned, where the crime is occurring. And then sharing the intel. Every morning, 0930, I meet up with all the other commanders, the, the uh, Specialized Intelligence Division, and a lot of other different sections. There's probably 50 people on this call, and we share intel. 
and all that information gets shared within a 15, 20 minute period and uh, it's very beneficial. We have lots of meetings at the police department. Uh, this department is one of the best I've ever seen about sharing intel. And we don't just share it within our facility. Externally, we share it. We share it with Tennessee Highway Patrol. We share it with our neighboring uh, partners around Nashville. Um, some of the things about technology that we're looking into uh, is sky cops. Sky cops are great. I'm going to be getting assigned uh, a sky cop that I can use just for West Precinct. Right now, we have a sky cop located at McPherson where that shooting took place. Uh, uh, multiple juveniles were at the, next to the park, and we moved the sky cop out there within a few days after that occurred. Since then, we have not had a single crime <coughs> occur. I say that because I say that very humbly because that's usually when something goes bad. When I when I brag about something we did that was really good, so uh, I'll say it quietly. Um, but one of the great one of the great things about being out at West, and, and I'll end on this note, unless you have questions, is the council members are involved. We have a great relationship. They contact me when something occurs. I share information to them when something occurs, so you will get the information firsthand. Don Aaron's office is very good about getting out media releases very quickly. Uh, when the uh, and I responded to that uh, tragic event when the plane crash occurred just a few weeks ago. That was a huge incident to man. We were there for three days before we terminated that command. And fortunately, it wasn't a large crash scene. I, I've seen other crash scenes that were large, but that one was very contained. But we worked very well with our federal partners, the FAA, the NTSB, Tennessee uh, Highway Patrol came out and provided support to us, but West was in charge of the crime scene. And we handled that very well and very professionally. I'm very proud of the men and women that showed up that night and handled things uh, professionally. But that's all I had, unless you have questions for me. Hope I didn't take too much time. We're gonna call the questions to take those and we take all the random questions for zoning and everything. We're gonna cluster that together. So if you'll hold your questions right now, that looks great, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and call Matt Wilkinson up. He's going to give us a brief rundown on the zoning process and the bills that are out there. And just behind him, we'll bring Councilmember Horton up, and he'll do his piece in about, I'm looking at 7.15 and 7.30. I'm sorry, 7.15 and 7.20. We'll start, and we'll ask everybody to line up here that wants to speak and ask a question. The reason we're doing it that way is because of the microphones. I'm recording this so that we can then post the video for anybody that wasn't able to be here. And we'll also be reviewing your questions so that we can post answers and put that out to the community as well so that we can get the maximum out of this tonight. Hi, everybody. It's Matt Wilkinson. I'm in the Can you guys hear me? Okay. I, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Better? All right, sorry. Um, anyway, so my name is Matt Wilkinson. I'm in the uh, council office, um, not with the planning department, it's separate. Um, and so I will go over a brief process on how amendments to the zoning code are generally done, and then do a very brief overview of the eight bills that were part of this sort of packet of bills. So generally speaking, um, changes to the zoning code are like any other ordinance that is done. Um, it is prepared either by our office or by the planning department or sometimes by codes and that's your legal. And then from there, um, the sponsoring council member chooses to introduce the bill. Um, once introduced um, for Title 17 bills that require a public hearing, what will generally happen is one of two things. They'll either be passed on first reading and then deferred out to allow planning <coughs> to review and provide a recommendation from the planning commission that includes a public hearing at the Planning Commission. <coughs> or it will be deferred um, on first reading, which is what happened in this case, where um, it, it was not passed on first, it's just deferred out so the planning and other departments have some more time to look at things. And then once planning is comfortable with it, then it can move along in the process and go on to the uh, Planning Commission. Once the uh, bill or bills have received the recommendation from the Planning Commission, 
then it comes back to the Metro Council, and at Metro Council, then it has a public hearing there. So it has a second public hearing, a second opportunity for public engagement at the council meeting. Um, and there, there will be debate on the floor between council members um, and whatnot. And then from there, should it continue to move forward, it will pass second reading, the third reading, which would be at the following meeting for more debate, more discussion. And should it continue to advance, it would pass that and then become effective upon publication in a newspaper by the uh, Metropolitan Clerk. At any point, it can be amended. However, generally speaking, amendments normally occur on second and third reading um, to the effect of not creating an issue where you have to resend it back over to the Planning Commission so they have to start over their review. Um, for some of these Title 16 bills, however, Title 16 does not go to the Planning Commission, so it does not have a public hearing. Um, it is a standard bill, like every other ordinance that we pass. It just has three readings at council with no public hearing. And so that's sort of the distinction between the two. Title 17 has two public hearings, one at the Planning Commission and one at the Council. Title 16, Title 15, all the other titles, excluding things related to short-term rentals, um, generally don't have public hearings as a standard practice. However, there, there may be instances where the Council chooses to establish a public hearing for the um, particular bill under consideration. So moving forward into the bills being discussed, uh, I guess all around the community lately, um, there are about eight of them. I'm just gonna do a brief rundown. Um, I'll go in a little more detail. Uh-oh, uh-oh, sorry, there it goes. Um, I'll just do a brief rundown. I will go into a little more detail on the ones that are being led sponsored by Councilmember Quinn Evans Siegel, who's not here. I'll let Councilmember Horton go into greater detail on his bills that he's lead sponsoring. And so to start it off, the first one is BL 2024-181, which is an amendment to Title 16 to allow for multifamily residential buildings up to six stories in height with no more than four dwelling units per floor to have a single stairway to serve the building. Um, because this is sponsored by Councilmember Horton, I'll let him go into greater detail on what that bill entails. The next one is BL 2024-182, lead sponsor Quinn Evan Siegel. Um, this one also amends Title 16. Um, it requires the codes, it does um, three things primarily. Um, it requires the codes director to maintain an online database of residential and multifamily permits issued. It eliminates the requirement for gas stations to have separate public restrooms for each sex. However, a requirement for a restroom would still be in there. Um, it also eliminates the requirement for uh, residential structures built under the adopted residential code, which is single family and two family structures to have a washer dryer hookups as part of their construction. So new homes and new duplexes would no longer be required to have washer dryer hookups included as part of their construction. Um, moving on to BL 2024-183, this one also amends Title 16. It creates a, a new use uh, to the adopted International Building Code called Large Unit Homes, including establishing what is um, what it is and what the construction methods for the construction of the, the large unit home use. Uh, large unit homes are defined in this ordinance as being three or four unit single multifamily structures with common walls that is no more than three stories tall and 5,000 square feet with the intent that they would look sort of like a, a, a larger single family home. Maybe something like the bigger homes that you see around town, but instead of being one unit, it would be carved up into three or four. Um, it also would classify large unit homes as a group R2 construction, which is the building code's definition for multifamily. Um, and, so, um, and so that's really what that one does. Um, moving on to BL 2024-184. So now we're moving into the zoning code. So the, this one will have a public hearing if it continues to advance at both the Planning Commission and at Council. This one um, does a bunch of different little things around the code. It, um, changes the name of accessory dwelling unit detached to detached accessory dwelling unit to match sort of the nomenclature that sort of evolved since the passage of that use. Um, it also updates the relevant references to that name throughout the code. Um, it changes the name of residents for handicapped no more than, more than eight individuals to residents for persons with disabilities more than eight individuals. And it also updates that definition and relevant references to update the name change and the change from handicapped to uh, persons with disabilities. Um, it also amends the definition for multifamily 
The current definition refers to a multifamily as uh, three or more units on a single structure. In practice, with how the codes department has been enforcing the multifamily use, it's three or more units on a parcel. And so this, this change just changes single structure to single parcel to match how codes has been enforcing that use. Um, it continues on, actually. This is a long one. Um, it also makes the bar nightclub use permitted by right in the industrial zoning districts, IWD, IR, and IG. And it does this because there's another use that is already permitted in the zoning districts called an after hours establishment. And there's a bit of a hazy area between those two and the zoning administrator put forward this change as a way to sort of clarify that. And I'm sure um, our representative from Coates can go into more detail on that if you have questions on that. And then finally, um, well, not finally, there's one more after this one, sorry. It uh, <laughs> makes the daycare use over 75 use, daycare center over 75 use permitted with conditions in office neighborhood, mixed use neighborhood, and commercial neighborhood zoning districts, as well as their various variants, like the alternative districts and the non short term rental districts. So this means that right now you aren't allowed to have daycare centers with more than 75 um, kids in them in those zoning districts, and it should this bill pass you would be able to, with conditions, have that use in those zoning districts. And finally, I just call it, it now it's finally, um, it adds a definition for one half story to the contextual overlay. Uh, contextual overlay is a zoning overlay that regulates the size of homes in residential neighborhoods based on the surrounding homes. And it had a reference to a one half story in the height requirement, but there was no definition <coughs> for it. So this just puts the definition there. So the zoning administrator and builders know what the standard is for that. Um, I mean, moving on to the heavy hitters, which I'm sure why a lot of you guys are here tonight. Um, BL 2024-185, which is also sponsored by Councilmember Quinn M. Siegel. Um, this one is actually to be withdrawn based on um, a public announcement I believe the Councilmember made. I, I believe the Councilmember Wiener, or Councilmember Horton can go into greater detail on that, if that's still the case. But as far as I'm aware, the, count, the lead sponsor Councilmember is intending to withdraw this bill at the next council meeting. This is the one that amends Title 6, 13, and 17 to create a new residential scale multifamily use in the zoning code. This is the one that um, would define that residential scale multifamily as being two, three, or four unit single structure residential buildings that are designed in such a way to resemble a single family home or a traditional duplex. And it would allow that use in all zoning districts that permit single family, the single family use with conditions limiting the use to the urban services district and outlining site um, and structure design requirements. So um, if you were in the urban services district and this bill, if it were to have passed, you would have been able to do that. Um, outside of the urban services district, um, this use would not have been available to you. However, as I said earlier, um, this is to be withdrawn and there is a study underway at the planning department um, that I believe they were just um, authorized by a uh, resolution at the Metro Council last meeting um, to study housing and everything. So there could be something in the future from that, but at, for all intents and purposes for right now, this, this bill is uh, no longer being pursued as far as I'm aware. Um, moving on to BL 2024-186, this is the other heavy hitter. It's also planning to be withdrawn based on public comment by the um, lead sponsor. I'll let the other council members confirm if that's still the case. It also amends Title 17 to expand the two-family use to RS and RSA zoning districts as a conditionally permitted use. Um, so in RS zoning districts, you would be able to build two-family or duplexes. Um, this one also has a restriction to the urban services district. So if you're outside of the urban services district, this change would not have applied to you. Um, it also would have removed um, existing conditions on two-family use in the other residential zoning districts that permit it, AG, AR2, AR, RA, uh, related to the eligibility and location of it. Um, however, as I stated earlier, this one's also to being withdrawn, so as of right now, it's no longer anticipated to be under consideration. Um, moving on to BL 2024-187, this one's by Councilmember Horton. I'll let him explain a little more. It amends Title 17 to allow single-family, two-family, multi-family uses by right in the commercial services zoning districts and its various variants, including the alternative and no short-term rentals um, districts. And then the last one is BL 2024-188, also by Councilmember Horton. This one has been deferred indefinitely, so I don't know how much detail um, Councilmember Horton wants to go into it. 
um, because it's also sort of under review by planning based on some things they're looking at with stormwater and some other stuff. But it um, amends Title 17 to eliminate minimum lot area for multifamily mobile homes and non-residential uses in RM zoning districts. However, it did not um, amend the allowed units per acre for RM zoning districts. So it didn't, uh, it, it didn't theoretically increase the permitted potential density of those districts. It just sort of changed the, the, the lot size you're already. But I'll let the council member go into more of that. <coughs> and that was the uh, last one, so sorry for the drag <laughs> and all of that. As he mentioned, I'm the primary uh, sponsor and author of four pieces of zoning and building code reform. Um, one of them already passed, so I, I have the pre-approved pattern book one, so I'm not going to spend a ton of your time on that one, but focus on the three uh, that are still being considered by council. And those three, uh, as he mentioned, are uh, generally called single stair legislation, uh, expanding housing in commercial services districts, uh, and eliminating minimum lot areas for multifamily housing. I think I'll explain each of those generally, and then as Council Member Wiener said, we can take questions at the end. Um, so the first one, uh, single stair reform. Uh, what this does is amend uh, Nashville's building code. And the way that our current building code works for multifamily structures <coughs> is it says if you have a multifamily structure, like an apartment building, uh, you're allowed to have a single staircase for the first three stories. Above three stories, you're required to have two staircases, and this is designed as a fire safety or life safety measure. The problem with the two stair requirement is that is the floor plan that this mandates basically on every floor. And the floor plan that this mandates is essentially a long hallway with apartments on each side connecting two staircases at each terminus. Uh, the issue with this is if you're, you're in one of these apartment units, uh, and if you're looking in front of you, there's a wall with windows. Uh, to your left is a wall neighboring the left uh, apartment. To the right is your other neighboring apartment, and behind you is the hallway. The problem with this is that there's only one wall with windows, which is an issue, uh, because if you think of the way that most people like to live, is to have a window in at least every bedroom. And having this mandated floor plan means that Nashville's entire apartment stock caters exclusively towards Studio One and two bedroom apartments which is very difficult if you have a family-sized household. So it forces family-sized households that are, you know, maybe want three or four more bedrooms exclusively into single-family homes, whether they want to or not. And, you know, a lot of families do want single-family homes, but many can't afford it, especially young families, uh, perhaps, you know, want to start off in, in a more affordable apartment. And so what my legislation does is amends our building code in 15 different ways. One of which is to increase the number of floors that can have a single staircase from three to six. And the other 14 amendments are height and safety requirements. Uh, the gist of this is essentially that every apartment unit in the structure will be a corner unit, meaning that there's multiple walls with windows and now you can accommodate family-sized apartment units. Uh, the end result being you have safe, uh, family size affordable uh, apartment units. Uh, to talk about the safety aspects in a little or in high detail, some of the, the main parts are heightened uh, sprinkler requirements, basically requiring the Rolls Royce of sprinkler systems. Uh, according to FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, less than 1% of fires in multifamily structures are in staircases. And on top of that, sprinklers are 97% at effective at eliminating uh, fires. Uh, some of the other safety uh, requirements are pressurization requirements in the staircase. Uh, basically, means if you open the staircase door, air flows out, which means fire's not flowing in. Uh, some of the other ones, are, each floor is limited to 4,000 square feet and four, and four units. So these are very small uh, apartment buildings that can be evacuated in less than 20 minutes. Uh, so these are, the, the end result here being that these are much safer than the apartment buildings that we're building today without these heightened safety requirements, uh, while also making sure that we're providing apartments that can accommodate uh, families at a more uh, affordable price point. Uh, so that's the first item, that's single stair reform. Uh, 
the next one is expanding housing in commercial districts. And this one is going to be amended. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to defer one meeting and then amend it. So I'll tell you about what the amended version is going to be, so you're getting the correct information. And so, what the goal of expanding housing in commercial districts is, it's really twofold. Uh, one is just to build more housing. We have a you know acute housing shortage in Nashville, which has driven the cost of housing to astronomical levels. So we need more housing. That's one aspect. The second one is to focus that housing construction where it makes the most sense in close proximity to uh, commercial opportunities. Uh, if you think about what's kind of characterized development patterns in the United States really since World War II, it's been a rigorous separation of uses. It's been houses go here, uh, apartments go here, offices go there, stores and restaurants you know, go here. The end result being that anytime you want to do anything, you have to get in your car and drive. And it's one reason that Nashville, like a lot of other cities, is experiencing uh, such terrible car traffic and congestion. I think we were ranked the worst community in America last year. And so the solution to that is to intermix these uses so that you don't have to drive everywhere you want to go. Now, I think if I introduce legislation that would introduce commercial opportunities into residential areas, I think that would be enormously disruptive to established neighborhoods it's not what people signed up for, it's not what you know, their neighborhood wants. If I do the reverse of those here and introduce uh, residential uses into commercial districts, it's not disruptive to uh, surrounding neighborhoods, and it, the people know what they're getting into and probably welcome that kind of mixed use and walkable environment. Uh, some of the amendments I'm doing currently can do housing in commercial districts, subject to certain conditions. Uh, one of which means it has to be on a busy road in Ontario or Collector Street. Um, so this would allow you to build it off of busy streets. So we're not just pushing multi-family housing out onto the pipes, which are you know the loudest and dirtiest and most dangerous you know parts of the city where there's no sidewalks or anything like that. Every year we send new numbers of traffic fatalities and pedestrian deaths. So allow them off of busy streets while making sure that the housing that we're not that we're letting off of those busy streets is not eligible for short-term rental property. Being disrupted to surrounding properties with bachelor parties or something like that. Uh, another condition um, that I'm adding back in is, is a notification requirement to the district council member so that the community is kept aware of uh, housing developments and they should provide the opportunity to uh, provide input to it. Uh, so that's the second one, the expanding housing in commercial service decisions. Uh, the final one, uh, as Matthew mentioned, is uh, eliminating minimum lot areas for multifamily. Uh, this is the provision that a lot of people don't know is in the zoning code. Basically, it's what the current requirement is. It says in order to fit you know, any type of multifamily structure on a lot, the lot has to be at least a certain size. Uh, it, that minimum lot area doesn't affect the actual density requirement for the lot. The best way to think about density is as a ratio or a fraction. It's normally expressed as you know, number of units per acre, and that fraction goes through depending on the size of the lot. However, below a certain lot, the zoning code currently tells you that you're not allowed to put multi-family housing in there. What that means is that a lot of small lots in our city, which are disproportionately located in urban districts, especially with my neighborhood and the nations, a third of my neighborhood is too small, uh, is not allowed to fit multi-family housing in it, even though we want it. What that does is it pushes multi-family housing development out into more rural and suburban districts, like out here in Bellevue. Uh, so my legislation will eliminate that minimum size and allow the empower or communities more power to fit or not fit multi-family housing uh, where it makes the most sense. So really the goal is to provide uh, flexibility for you know, the district council member or y'all to fit or say yes or no uh, to multi-family where you want it. And especially to empower housing to be built in our urban communities and relieve relieve development pressures on more rural and suburban neighborhoods uh, who may be less welcome into it. Uh, so those are the three uh, pieces of uh, legislation that I sponsored for. Uh, and I can answer questions at the question session. Thank you. So at this point, I want to give thanks to Elaine Alvarez for our
first order, Gloria Hauser may have been tonight. So. <laughs> if you would like to make a comment, we're taking all the feedback we can get. Um, if you have questions and you haven't written them down on your card, first of all, if you have a card that you can fill out, would you just raise it up in the air so I can see how many we need to come by and pick up? Okay, we're going to bring the bag around in a few minutes. There are, does anybody need a card to make a note on? Okay, we'll go outside and get some and we'll pass them out as we start going through this. Um, if you want to ask a question, or thank you, John, um, or make a comment, if you would line up on the aisle down here to the microphones, um, my trusted friend Patty is going to keep time so that we can keep this um, to a reasonable conclusion. Um, we want everybody to have a chance to make their comments and ask questions. Um, because we're in this cavernous body, it would be really helpful if you will use a microphone and so come on down here. And that means you can start coming down now. Yeah. Yeah, I am. I am. So um, we're going to give everybody a minute. Um, Patty's going to be keeping time. She'll let you know. I'm sorry. Where. I didn't quite catch that. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Oh, kind of right. It's a good thing. Um, and so anyway, Patty will let you know when you have um, 15 seconds left. She will also let you know when it's time to let somebody else have a turn. Again, we've got it recorded. Hopefully nobody calls my cell phone and it doesn't disrupt the proceedings. My question is this on? Can you hear me? Um, it should be on. My question is for uh, Commander Kendall. I don't think you've heard me. It's for him. Commander. My question is for Commander Kendall. Uh, a year or so ago, we were hearing a good bit about trafficking that was coming through Nashville uh, because we have so many highways coming through and also about fentanyl. Well, I haven't heard as much about it lately. I doubt that the problem has just disappeared. Is it just that it's fallen off the radar or could you enlighten us on those two issues, please? No, we are uh, still actively working cases like that. Uh, not that long ago, we got a very large amount of drugs uh, off one of the interstates. So those cases are still being worked and we are working with the federal authorities as well as we get intel and information on those. Uh, it wasn't that long ago we did, did a uh, tactical takedown and uh, were able to seize a, a large amount of drugs and or uh, fentanyl, those drugs as well. Is it trafficking? Yeah. And regarding the trafficking, yes, we are still working, actively working cases. Uh, I know the TBI is working cases and we, uh, we, SID, our Specialized Investigation Division, they're the ones that are involved in that. Uh, I'll be glad to talk to you offline if there's anything specific or any specific areas that you're concerned about. Thank you. Next. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you all for your service. And my first comment and question is for Commander Kendall. Um, I heard you say that most of the people committing the crimes in Bellevue do not live in Bellevue, that they come from other places. But does it seem like everybody just sort of crisscrosses around town? Because the incident that happened at 8.15 p.m. in Kroger, those people did not live in Bellevue. And then the incident that happened at the Circle K, which is across the street from Kroger, those people did not live in Bellevue. But the incident that happened at the parking lot in MLK in the middle of broad daylight, those suspects were picked up in Bellevue at, I'll just go ahead and say the name of the apartment complex, at Arrive, formerly Iroquois, which is feet away from both of those other incidents. And then at one point, I don't know how many, oh, I have to stop already. <laughs> Darn, okay. I had a lot more, but that's okay. I'll call you later. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good, very good question. Uh, 
So a lot of them do come in out of uh, our community, uh, but we have a lot that live in our community, many which are juveniles, that our community crimes outside in other precinct areas. So they're going where the opportunity is, they're going where the activity is, and then I feel that they're coming here uh, because they feel that it's a safe, quiet place that they can go out and try to do those drug transactions. And that's what we're we're trying to combat those with Operation 72. Does that answer your question? Um, sort of. <coughs> I mean, I feel like that they come here because the people who, the other people who are committing crimes and buying the drugs are here. We Their could. customers are here. Yes, ma'am. We do have some criminal activity out here. We do, we do have, you know, drug users, and we have drug activity out here. No question about it. I don't feel we have it as much here as some of the other uh, geographical areas and other precincts. We are very fortunate here in comparison. I'll say that. But uh, I can tell you that a lot of the, the break-ins to vehicles have been through kid, even kids that attend this high school just two weeks ago. Uh, so they're experiencing with, they're getting with the wrong crowds, and they're having that wrong influence, and maybe they don't have enough parental guidance at the time, and they're going out and committing those crimes. But they're not just doing them here. They are doing them in other precincts because we're, we're finding them here from, I'll just say, another precinct, South Precinct, and then they're finding kids from our community that's going out there because who they're associating with. There's a lot of connections and nexus between those juveniles. drive-by shooting from the apartments they're subsidized and my question is is there any responsibility to the owners of these apartments because I know they live in Los Angeles I already looked them up they have no place there's the crime that's affecting my neighborhood and the kids that live in these apartments that deserve a happy healthy childhood like like why are they allowed to be like this when it is subsidized I'm just wondering are they held to any standards to keep this title of section 8 or you know, I see. That's my concern. Myself and some of the council members have met with some of the complexes, and we've made recommendations, uh, strong recommendations of, you know, what they could do to mitigate these things, such as hiring armed security. That particular complex you're talking about did hire, they did react, they did hire armed security. Well done. Well done. It's okay. They, they did hire uh, armed security. Now, I got the message not a week ago from that same complex that they are cutting back now because it is too much of a cost for them. It's $25,000 a month, they said, to the armed security, which is quite, experience, uh, quite expensive to uh, combat crime. I, I get that and understand you know, that from a business standpoint. We have put an enormous amount of resources uh, in some of those complexes. I've got over 3,000 extra patrols and you think about that each time an officer goes in there that's time away from other communities so uh, I would be remiss if I didn't express to you that I, I get frustrated sometimes because I'm pleading with them you know to do the right thing and put some money into the complex continue the security uh, even if it's not armed security having somebody out there watching uh, my community coordinator, Shelby Hughes, to, your, to, to my immediate right, some of your left there, Shelby is a community coordinator, and she's having community engagement programs uh, out there in order to try to build some trust with these juveniles. Uh, some, some of these apartments have four and five juveniles, and they're all under the age of 12. And when school's out, there's nobody watching. So that's frustrating to me because we want, we want somebody out there to provide some guidance and uh, mentorship to these kids and build trust. So it is a complicated issue. I'm not, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat that at all. It is a very complicated issue and it's not a quick, easy fix. We have to pull together, have some resources that will uh, be funded to help that community and we also have to uh, we have to have a meeting 
perhaps with the owners to get them to do some things that will mitigate some of these, uh, the shots fired call. You know, juveniles get together and they fire rounds in the air and they have no idea or awareness of where those rounds might go. That's very dangerous. And that's probably what happened over in that community. But I can say this, since we put a sky cop, we put a sky cop out there, at, right at the entrance of that complex, right by in front of the manager's uh, office, even, and which we invited the management there yesterday to the, to the meeting. Unfortunately, they, they didn't make it. But we're, we're doing a lot, of, a lot of things, a lot of good things. But uh, I think my, my opinion is we set up a meeting with the community and not a meeting to, to bash the ownership, but to say, you know, there's more strength in numbers and we try to communicate with them and say, this is what we're seeing, what, what can you all do? That would be my recommendation. And I, I will just add, are you Casey? Yes, yes. hi. And so we were talking yeah. about yeah. the yeah. meeting. Yes. So I will add, Major Kendall, that, that um, uh, Sergeant Hughes and, and you have been working with me and your community and the community right next door um, to set up just such a meeting. So we're hoping for April 22nd, I'm gonna reach out to the apartment um, manager and, and ask her super nicely if she can please, please, please come. And I'm hoping with enough notice, you know, three weeks, maybe that's enough notice for her to attend, so. Thank you, Thank you Councilman. Uh, I wanted to add on that too, that uh, since we, we did a report and we ran it uh, two months back, uh, and we have not had a single uh, incident of a crime where someone was injured or hurt at that complex, which is really important. But the fear that shots being fired aimlessly that that, that can cause is very dangerous. So um, we'll, we'll stay on it and thank you for coordinating that meeting and invite me to it as well. So we did a whole survey and nothing was ever going to be done to that part. So transparency, I have a huge issue with that with stormwater. And also for CM Horton, I was just wondering, you said we, with your legislation, I wonder what community groups you've reached out to in the nation's area. Because I have a lot of individual family members that live there and they're not very happy with what the legislation that you're pushing for. Yep. So I can take each of those in turn. Uh, perhaps the first one was about stormwater. Right. Um, so to take them um, one at a time. So uh, the single stair legislation. I think whether a structure has one or two staircases is unexpected to have any effect on yeah. on stormwater. Um, in housing and commercial services districts, um, in this one we're not permitting a building where there wouldn't be one already because they're already allowed to build a store, a bar, or a restaurant. It, you know, if that structure instead holds a family, it's not contributing to stormwater. Um, additionally, um, for uh, eliminating minimum lot areas for multifamily housing, this doesn't rezone anything, so it's not, you know, permitting, uh, or, you know, saying you could build, a, you know, rezoning any structure that's currently in your district. There could be an effect on stormwater where something is already zoned for multifamily. Uh, I'm holding somebody else's question. Um, where it's already zoned for multifamily, but the lot is too small for them to build anything. If they could build something where they can't today, conceivably that could have an effect on stormwater. Uh, the planning department just conduct or concluded a study uh, which initially shows that these types of development don't, do not have a, an adverse effect on stormwater. What I've done, they're about to start the second phase of that study. I've indefinitely deferred my bill to allow them the time to uh, conclude that study so that we can be confident um, what effect, if any, this will have on stormwater. And where can the average citizen find that study? Uh, Matt, can, maybe planning can speak to that. So, um, okay, sorry. So the, um, the second phase of study that Council Member Horton mentioned is something that we're currently scoping out. We need the planning department with the Department of Water Services, um, and we're taking a 
lot of feedback we've heard from others, like Council Member, uh, member Druffel in the community, um, in terms of understanding stormwater impacts and, and looking at our regulations and code regulations to see if there are any changes to, to strengthen those regulations and, and improve them in any way. Uh, so stormwater um, analysis and recommendations, um, when we have that study um, funded and, and, um, and the scope of work you know, available, we'll, we'll create um, you know, website um, pages and other types of notifications so folks are, are readily uh, aware of and the type of work. Where would we find that? Um, we, uh, we're still you know, scoping out that project, but I would imagine either the Pine Department website or Water Services would be one of the key departments that could uh, you know, list sure. any information related to those, those studies. Okay. And then uh, one more question. Um, parking. Parking in the nations is already terrible. So I was just wondering how, when you increase the number of families that you put in this area, how you're going to do it. Yeah, so, I mean, I will say, so there's a separate zoning proposal going on that's unique to the nation that doesn't apply outside of, even to other neighborhoods in my district, or alone out here in Bellevue. I think, you know, I'm happy to maybe talk offline about neighborhood-specific stuff in the nation and perhaps some of this is stuff that's relevant for, for Bellevue. I think, generally, then, the nation's there's currently, I think we have about eight parking spots per car in the nation, so there's not like a shortage of a shortage of parking spots currently. It's there are certain times of the day where certain developments do have you know more people trying to go there than there are parking spots, and I think in that instance, the instance of issue is not that we don't have enough parking spots, but that we have too many cars. And the reason for that is that our neighborhood is not safe to walk in the neighborhood. I think any resident of our neighborhood can tell you that we don't have enough sidewalks, we don't have enough crosswalks. Cars are flying down the roads in unsafe speeds, 50 miles an hour or more on residential streets. A lot of people drive in our neighborhood, uh, even if they live within walking distance, just because they don't feel safe to walk. Uh, so we're undergoing you know, a strong effort right now for traffic calming, for more sidewalks, more crosswalks, trying to relieve strains on our parking infrastructure currently. And it's, it's hard for community groups. There's four main community groups in our neighborhood, and the nations, I'm sorry to talk about the nations here in Bellevue. There's a nation's neighborhood association, there's a business association, there's a self-appointed planning and zoning committee, and then there's a handful of churches. I think I've probably met with six different churches. I've met with the neighborhood association five different times, two different times with the planning and zoning committee, as well as every month with our business committee. Okay, thank you. But he has such a large area. He seems has such a large area. What are our chances of getting another precinct? We are, Bellevue now extends out past McCrory Lane, and we're getting more and more development out there. Are there any proposals or any scheduled to get us another precinct? The answer is yes. It has been on the table for a lot of years. Um, part of the issue is staffing. wish list of things, it's, it's in the hopper, um, but just in terms of being able to man it, being able to facilitate um, the structure, the location, it's just not going to be quick. Um, <coughs> additionally, um, just because you have a police precinct in your community does not directly impact crime or the lack of crime or the reduction of crime. Because the police officers don't sit in the precinct all day. The police officers are out in our neighborhoods, and that's where we want them to be. Um, so that's that's the short answer we got on the Commanders of District One. Commander Kendall, would you please address <coughs> the potential for a new police precinct and how that would or would not help? Are we, uh, is the inquiry about a uh, new police precinct in this geographical area? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I know they're, they're building the southwest, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the southeast precinct. That's our ninth precinct. They're building that now. It's under construction. Um, that, that is a matter where, you know, the, 
it would have to be approved through Metro Council and the funding and all that in order to build another precinct. We, we've got a building uh, at 5500 Charlotte Avenue that's adequate enough in size uh, to support the employees that are working there. I've got anyone employees working there. If you, if you came to my community room, you see it's a large community room that you're all entitled to. If you ever want to have a meeting there, just get in touch with the community coordinator. But we have we have a structure there large enough. Uh, what helps more than anything for you all is to see the officers out there visible and in those areas where you need them. So um, if the question's how do we police better, it's, it's have more officers out there on the street, not sitting in our buildings. Not, 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 I don't encourage that at all. If they're sitting inside the, the structure, it's a sergeant who's working on a pack, a pursuit packet or some administrative duty, but we want them out in the field. Our detectives, they're working in the building, they're working cases, doing follow-ups and calls and things like that. But patrol in uniform, we want them out in the field uh, responding to calls for service. That's the number one priority. And the number two priority is getting in those areas where the crimes are occurring with precision. That's the second priority, if you could say. Does anybody have a card before we take this? Do you have a card, Richard, again? And John will come collect them and bring them down here and we'll read them. And we'll see if we can't get you some answers before you leave tonight. Go ahead. for you, Commander, and thank you to everyone for coming tonight. Uh, I could sit here and ask tons of questions all night long, and everybody would stop. But anyway, um, if you could please clarify the number of autos that are stolen. You said, I think, 160 or have been for the year. Is that, or 161, something like that. Is that 37221, or is that Davidson County? The motor vehicle thefts that uh, the number I gave you year to date was 131 for the year 2024. Okay. That is the geographical area for West Precinct, the 108 square miles I referenced. Okay. So I can give you a number on how many were stolen just in your area code, and you can look it up. Uh, so if you go to data dashboard, if, has anybody ever used the crime data, the data dashboard metro? No. It's a great source of information calls for service, how many traffic accidents have occurred there, how many stolen vehicles have you had? All, all that information can be pulled from that, just your zip code or your district. You can type in uh, any of these council members' districts, uh, the district that you live in, and you can look at the crime just upon that. Just the crime maps. And it, it, breaks the crime maps it gives you numbers section. and it gives you crime maps too to, okay. to show the, the heat areas where the crimes are occurring. But, still, but that's a good question. Okay, well, no, if that's still the west side, 130, I thought it was 130. Uh, that's, I mean, almost two per day, which is significant for the year. Um, then with, um, is there an update on the murder of um, Ernie Aguilar? The last update that I, I got on that, which is pretty recent, is still an open, unsolved case. Um, they're still following up on what little leads that they did get on that case, but they haven't progressed to obtain any kind of prosecution or warrant on that. After a year, and it's been a year, those cases go to cold case. Uh, I, I said it's been a year, but it's <coughs> not a year, it's pretty close. And, and those cases go to our cold case uh, section who work those. They don't stop working. Detectives continue working until those are solved <coughs> or they can be they can Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then, Two more, real quick. Don't want you to bust your head. Okay, we're uh, um, Average number of officers on the street in 37221 in a 24-hour period. Do you know what that is? Well, it used to be four. We, I typically, I've been running about six officers. Uh, I, I told you five, five is the minimum. I require five. I can't run, I can't, we can't do our job with anything less than five. Mm -hmm. So. The answer is five, but that's for the entire uh, geographical area of West Precinct area. So I try to I try to run six or seven, and then I tell those sergeants get out there on the street, take calls. So that's a, that's a multiplier, and then during the overlap, as I mentioned, you double that. 
So you could have in your zip code area, if there's, you know, if that's where the activity is occurring, traffic or calls for service or reports taken, you could have as many as 10 during those peak hours. So those peak hours would be uh, during the overlap, which is 9 to about 1.30 in the morning, 9 p.m. to 1.30 in the morning, or during uh, those, those afternoon hours of about uh, 3 p.m. to about 4.30. Those are the peak hours. Okay, great. And then finally, um, you're just hearing so much about shoplifting that's going on in all these stores that we have worked so hard to get. And I know we don't have tons of shoppers in our area, so we want to keep those stores. And it, what's being done? I mean, I know store, it sounds like my friends that work in places are being told not to do anything really, because, and, you know, for their own safety, which is the right thing to do. But how is that being addressed? That is, uh, that is my favorite question tonight. Because we just ran a blitz operation last uh, week. We ran it for three days. We brought in uh, different uh, loss prevention managers, employees from different states that work with these businesses, such as Carter, Bed Bath Beyond, and all those locations. They still candles at Bed, Bed Bath and Beyond, like, uh, like thousands of dollars worth of candles. I didn't, I didn't realize that candles were that big a value, but they go online and they sell them, and they make a lot of money off candles. Uh, so what we're doing about it is we ran a blitz. We arrested a total of six persons. All the persons had uh, a criminal history. Some of them had violent histories. So they are related in, to uh, other crimes uh, that we talked about tonight. Green Hills Mall went to great, the Mall of Green Hills went to a great deal of effort in order to combat these. So they upgraded their security. They have a lot of technology out there. And some of their stores like Nordstrom changed from no hands-on policy to we are going hands-on. So a lot of stores don't want that liability. So they have a policy where you're, I'm working that store, but the policy, store policy is I will not put my hands on anybody. All I can do is say, please put that down, sir, and leave the store. <laughs> Gentleman's not going to listen to me. He's going to walk out with it because there's no consequence, right? right. Uh, but those stores that have done that, huge, like they're arresting people and we're having to respond to those calls, but we're seeing huge reductions at the Mall of Grand Hills, especially in the grab and runs, the more uh, aggressive grab and runs with the purses, Louis Vuitton. Uh, we're seeing reductions out there in that. So my recommendation to those stores, number one, have armed security out there at your store or in the complex. Purchase a sky top so we can videotape and watch live feeds of what's going on out there. Uh, buy in the fuses because that's a live feed as, all, uh, as well that we can re <coughs> so we can respond to very quickly. And then uh, we run, run the blitzes and the operations and the undercover uh, partnerships with our loss prevention. We're doing a pretty good job uh, in comparison to last year. We're up just slightly in West, but we got a lot of stores out here. Like we got more stores than half the precincts. Madison has a few, but they don't have the, the large strip mall and shopping, and the, they don't have the Mall of Grand Hills. They do have Rivergate, but it is not as there's not as many uh, together stores like we have out here in complexes. What about the mounted police? Thank you for bringing that up. So a few weeks back, uh, by recommendation of some really good folks, we had the mounted patrol. Uh, thank you, council members, who suggested that. Uh, we had them show up at uh, One Bellevue. I think they went to Nashville West some too. And our numbers went down in shoplifting. You wouldn't think that now patrol in those areas, in those extra patrols, would help decrease it. But people don't like to commit crimes with the police, and especially apparently with horses even. <laughs> <laughs> and we found that the juveniles that were causing, were causing some problems out there. I'm talking little 14, 15 year old kids that were out there uh, trying to rob a security guard. They used to bogging off and threatening and act like they got a gun, things like that. 14 year olds. Uh, but when they seen those mounted patrol, they just take off, they just took off running. The point to saying all that is we have made a lot of efforts, and those were those were overtime initiatives. We paid those officers overtime to be out there because I don't have a 
I don't have a mounted patrol at West. I had to pull from and request that from another division uh, to get them out there. But it was a effective tool. It really was. Well, thank you for doing it. And again, thank you all for your time. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We, uh, I want to caveat on that real quick. Uh, we also we started, uh, Chief Drake, Chief Green had us initiate a organized retail crime meeting that we meet on the meetings tomorrow morning and we share all of the intel on these people that we're arresting. Because what we're finding is it's the same people. Same people that are hitting north from are going to, uh, help me the one in south. Uh, I'm drawing a blank right now. Just built it. Can you Alex? Yeah. They're, they're going out there and then they're coming back and they're going to Madison. Over here. Hey, I'm Peter Allison. I'm, this is a question for the council members. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Gentleman Secretary. 
When you talk about four bills, I'm gonna make it very quick in one second. Getting through the process, I think that's one thing you mentioned. One thing that we have a great council, they've been very, all of these council members have been very supportive of, is that is making sure that the permitting process is expedited. That's where your challenges come in that when you look at affordability, because if it gets hung up in the permitting process, time is money. So if it takes extra time to get things processed through the system, then the affordability aspect of it changes because where they were initially wanting to keep the cost low, if it prolongs the process of getting a permit, then that cost has to be incurred somewhere. So who absorbs that? Not the developer, it's the, pur it's the purchaser. So that's one of the things that the council members have been working diligently along with the other departments. Uh, they've been coming down, making routine visits, uh, just checking on what is this process? What is the problem with the process? And they are very passionate about that. And one of the things that this council, along with the former council has done, is really emphasize department accountability and making sure that we as, in, as Metro employees are accountable to make sure that the constituents receive, receive the proper service that they should receive. And they are doing that. And we're committed to doing that also. Well, Will's going to address it from the code's perspective. Sure. Time. You guys are uh, Will Bond, Metro Coast Department. Uh, so we work with Mr. Honeysucker and Metro Water. Uh, the Coast Department is your uh, kind of one stop shop for your development services when it comes to building. Uh, the building permit process starts with our department. So you come, you file your building permit there. Uh, once it comes in through us and it's processed, we send it out to other departments to look at. Metro Water needs to review it, NDOT needs to look at it, the fire marshal. You know, there's all those different entities take a look and have a sign-off process take place. Um, but Mr. Honeysucker is right. He's like, you know, time is money. There's so much development. There's so much growth as far as people and infrastructure and things like that. There's so many outside factors other than growth and other than money that we don't want to slow the process down, including ourselves. Uh, and so we've had a couple of initiatives over the last year or so. Uh, we've revamped how we can hire and certify electrical inspectors. Uh, we went from having a backlog of electrical inspections at the Coast Department that was three weeks long now to a day and a half. We are doing plan reviews electronically in different ways where we can share plans with other departments. Uh, that way every entity is looking at the same plans, they can make the same notes. Uh, we're speeding things up. Uh, and so there's a lot of efforts going on. We, we have the support of the, the current council members, uh, the current mayor's office. And so that, that work is underway. Uh, but you know, you guys are here to hold us accountable because the, the growth is here. The people have to go somewhere, and if there's plans to put them somewhere, we have to make sure that we're not the ones slowing them down. But there's there's a lot of the efforts going going forth to make that happen. Next question. Yes, this is for Roland Horton regarding the blanket zoning, whether it's off the table, it's coming back. <coughs> There are hundreds of 
there's under 200,000. And like Tom, had, Tom said, there's 35,000 units being built, and it is a proven fact that our population dropped one and a half percent last year. So how is, how is that going to work? Why is it blanket, and why are we not allowed to protect our wildlife corridors? So thank you for that question. I think that's really important. Um, so this does not, the, the minimum lot size one does not rezone a single property um, in all of Nashville and Davidson County. It takes the requirements away from developers, and they will do that, and they will not build affordable housing. It will be like yours. <laughs> that's right. It takes the requirements away. Yeah, so again, this doesn't actually rezone anything. The whole goal of this one is to empower communities to be able to rezone it where they want. So I think, you know, your point of wanting to preserve larger lots and, uh, you know, wildlife and green spaces is an important point. And that's exactly what this thing is designed to uh, protect. Uh, currently, if you want to have multifamily housing, the only place that you're allowed to bid is on those large lots that you want to protect. Uh, Current? There's no minimum lot size that you could put four on an acre. So that's the difference between the minimum lot size and the density requirement itself. So say something's currently zoned for a single family home. If I limit the minimum lot size, this is still just zoned for a single family home. That's all that you're allowed to build on. If you but there's no minimum lot size if you're taking the minimum lot size. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, so this doesn't change the size of the lot. It's, it just says the size of the lot that you're allowed to fit multi-family housing on if you zone it that way. So say that you know, a developer is coming to Bellevue and they say, we want to build this, I don't know, five townhomes or something like that um, on this lot. And you know, say it's a large lot and, and the community says, no, we don't want it here. This is a large, you know, this is a beautiful green space that has trees and something the neighborhood's always like, we don't want it here. We would be open it to it in this smaller lot that's you know maybe closer to you know where we are now or something like that. The zoning code currently says, sorry, we can't do it on that that smaller lot. Uh, so what this would really do is give uh, the community and the district council member, whoever that is, more ability to fit it where it makes the most sense for you. It doesn't force it to be built that way. It doesn't rezone. It doesn't anything. stop it. And developers will put those on. I don't understand your answer. Uh, only if it's zoned that way. Only if you rezone it that way. Uh, you want to speak back? I'll jump in. So um, I think the sorry. I think the important clarification here is that that bill in particular only affects RN zoning. So residential multifamily zoning. It doesn't impact R zoning. It doesn't impact RS zoning. It doesn't impact mixed use zoning or any other zoning. It only impacts RN zoning. And so if those properties out near where you live are zoned RN multi-family, multi-family, RM2, RM4, RM6. They're single family, so that would remove the single family and allow it to be four foot. So that, that bill is a different one. That one is um, currently, as far as I'm aware, being withdrawn by the staff. Both of said it's coming back. And, no, and you're no. referring to it. No, right. It's withdrawn. 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 Yeah, it's, 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 and um, planning is doing a housing study and something in the future could come from that, but it would be different. It's not going to be the same thing that this is being withdrawn. What Rollins, um, or Councilmember Horton's bill does is eliminate minimum lot size for RN zoning district lots, but it doesn't change the density. So whether the lot, whether you carve up a parcel into 10 lots or leave it as one lot, if it's zoned RN 40, for instance, and it's a one acre parcel, it can have 40 units on that one acre site, whether it's 10 lots or one lot. It doesn't affect that. And the other thing too is like when you get out into the rural areas as well, the important thing to remember is that you would likely have to rezone that property on top of it to get to an RM zoning district. And at that point, it would have to meet policy, which would be reviewed by the planning department. So if you're in a P2 policy area, which is a rural policy area, they likely would not support something like an RM15 or an RM20. They may support an RM2, but that's only two units per acre. And so regardless of how they carve up those two acre sites or four acre sites, they're limited to the number that they can do per acre. Um, and so, and then I'll talk about the final backstop to all of that is regardless of what planning thinks, regardless of what a lot of other people may support in other parts of the county, if your district council member is against it, if your community is against it, it's probably not going to pass because the district council member has to sponsor it and it has to get 20, uh, 21 votes. If planning just approves it, it has to get 27. So it's not, um, so this bill in particular, it's not just going to rezone or change the um, entitlements countywide to everything. It's, it's pretty targeted just to the RM zoning districts. As it it's is. going to allow more 
more houses on the property though, and there's no tree ordinance, so really they could come in and take down all the trees. So it doesn't change lot coverage requirements. Uh, it, it, so you, a building, whatever it's zoned for, and again, it would have to, if you don't want multifamily, the district council can do to make sure that it's not zoned that way, and this would have no effect on it. Um, if, if you are willing to rezone it to multifamily and you wanted to fit multifamily there, um, it doesn't change the lot size requirement, so any building can still just take up the same percent of the lot. Multifamily is also generally subject to higher tree density tree unit requirements, and you'd be required to plant more trees than a, than a single family home. Planting trees doesn't help when you're taking but down old like growth trees. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Does anybody else have a question? I didn't get to one. Any other questions? I didn't, I didn't get to one. Uh, John Hunsaker for mayor. Yes. <laughs> Let's all give John some music for him. He is the right arm to 40 of us. And there's, like I said, there's nobody that can do it better than him. Anybody else have any comments? I was here, a big question, which I misplaced now somewhere in my pocket about um, the safety of, of single family structures. Um, so, and whether they're, 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 they're or single stair, sorry, single stair, uh, the single stair structures that I've been talking about. Um, so, the net result of the four new building modifications is that these are, these are much safer for the reasons that I, I spoke about. Um, it's not hyperbolic. Well, a lot of cities have already implemented this in the United States and around the world. Seattle's done it since the 1960s, and their evidence shows that we've had a much lower fire incident, incidence of fire deaths than we're having now. Uh, it's also been implemented in all of Europe and Japan, which have uh, lower incidence, incidences of fire death. Um, there's also a question about density. Uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't rezone anything. The alternative is a two-story structure, which could have hundreds of units, um, so it's smaller than what the alternative. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for coming. I just wanted to say, um, if you if you have questions we didn't get to, or something popped in your head when you walk out of here that you wish you'd ask, feel free to reach out to any of us anytime. Uh, our e email addresses are all the same: first name dot last name at nashville dot gov. So I'm Jason dot at nashville dot gov. Also, uh, understandably, a lot of the questions have been for Commander Kendall, and we greatly appreciate uh, him being here. He also has his own community meeting um, at West Precinct on the second Thursday of every month. Is that right? Um, at the precinct on Charlotte. It's a great opportunity to hear updates from him and his team, and also to ask you know, these sorts of questions and share information. So um, be sure to try to attend those. Thanks. Anybody else? Yeah. I'll just echo what everyone else has said, and thank you all for coming. Um, we are always reachable, and please do reach out if you have any questions, if you want to talk about any issues, if you need our help with something, that's what we're here for. So, and also thank you, Mary Keith. Well, I appreciate you. Um, so, yes, thank you. We're all here. Um, if anyone has any questions on the way out, I'm more than happy to stay as well. So, thanks so much. Oh, this is out. Thanks for coming.